And so, the last one. I'll end with this one. Um, one of the, probably the number one thing that stands in the way as a church, I hope and pray it's not our church, is judgmentalism. Is that people say, well, you know, I just, I would go to church, but I feel so judged. Which is crazy, isn't it? If the church is supposed to be the embodiment of Jesus on earth, and he, man, he reached out to the most judged among anybody in that society. And he reached out with love and grace and mercy and truth. But you ask, you ask people in Jacksonville, hey, what do you think about church? And, and not one person's going, wow, full of grace and mercy. They'll talk, about, they'll talk about how judgmental the church can be. And if we're honest, we earned it. And I don't want this to be that kind of place. I just want to share with you a story. It happened almost 20 years ago. I was about 21 years old. I was in seminary, uh, and I lived in Mur North Myrtle Beach, uh, South Carolina. It was in the summer, summer break, and nobody ever goes back to Dillon. You just keep going 30 minutes, and you get to Myrtle Beach, right? Kind of the redneck Riviera, and so that's where we would all go. And I had three jobs, all right? I worked three jobs. And the reason I had three jobs is because I was 21 years old, and I was a man, and I didn't want to live with my mama. I jot that down, some of you boys. All right. So it's a different sermon. I'm sorry. So I, uh, uh, I waited tables at Barefoot Landing. I was a youth pastor at a church about 30 miles inland, and I also worked the front desk at World Gym. So every morning I'd open the gym and work at World Gym, and it was great. And so the, the owner of World Gym was this great businessman because right across the street from World Gym was a Crazy Horse strip club. And, and uh, what he did is he went to Crazy Horse, and he told all of the dancers there, hey, girls, you get a free membership to World Gym. So every morning, about 10 o'clock, our place would fill up with the crazy horse dancers. And so there'd be like 10 or 12 girls and about 40 dudes from North Myrtle Beach, all right? Some of you are already getting nervous because I'll just call them strippers. Does that help you? Okay, so the strippers were there working out. And word gets out, you know, hey, guys, you can just work out at this gym, and they're all there. And so um, after they would work out, they would come over to the little counter and get like smoothies and stuff. And we began to just kind of chat and hang out. And they didn't know what to do with me. Like, I didn't fit in a category for them because, because uh, I was in seminary, so I would always have, like, the Bible out on the counter because I was doing a summer class. I was working on stuff. And we would, we would enter these dialogues. And what began to happen over the summer, you know, they would say, hey, you should come by the crazy horse. I'd go, nah, probably not ever, ever, ever going over there. We'll just talk here. And, uh, but what began to happen over the summer is that those girls became people, my friends. And I found out a lot of stuff about them. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have a, a great depth of knowledge in stripper world, but all the ones I knew, they had two names, right? Everybody had two names. And, and about halfway through the summer, they would tell me their real name. I'd be like, oh, so it's not Destiny? It's Betty. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, all of them had two names. Almost every one of them had a kid, a young daughter. And, uh, and they were all petrified that their kids would find out what they were doing. Almost every one of them had to drink something or take something before they got on stage. Almost every one of them, or all of them, every one of them, none of them, this was their plan. None of them said, this is what I wanted to do. They just got into it, and that the money was so good, they sort of got addicted to the money that they, they just, you know, they felt trapped. And so as we'd sit there, we'd talk about the gospel, and I'd talk about Jesus. And, and would I call their sin, sin? Yeah, man, I'd tell them, you're greedy. Look, I have to get three jobs to make in two weeks what you can make in one night. You can step away and, you know, wait tables with me. And we would talk about those things. But above everything else, I just wanted them to meet Jesus. That they were sinners just like I'm a sinner. Well, it was no different. And then towards the end of the summer, one of the girls, her name was Sunny, and she said, um, tell you what, I'll, I'll go to church with you. I remember thinking, uh-oh, are you sure? Um, and I, and I kind of got a little panic, right? Because, I, again, I wanted, to, I wanted her to meet Jesus. I just didn't necessarily want her to meet my church because uh, I just didn't know how that would go. I'm trying to figure out how to uninvite her. She's like, no, I'll, I'll drive. That would be great. I'll drive. What time do we need to leave? I was on staff at that church. I was the youth pastor. And, uh, and I told her what time, and she comes to pick me up in her convertible white Corvette. I thought, perfect, we'll fly right in under the radar in that bad boy. <laughs> and so me and Sonny and her daughter get in the Corvette, and it took us, you know, maybe 10 minutes to go 25 miles in that thing. And so 
And so we pull up to the church. Now, Sonny showed up uh, for church in like a sundress and high heels, real high, high heels, like maybe glass ones with a goldfish in it. You know what I mean? Like real high, high heels and a sundress. And it was a nice dress. And it was, it was, you know, in her mind, church clothes. But she looked like a stripper in a sundress. And, and she had she'd invested heavily into her career. You tracking with where I'm going there? Okay. All right. Don't come back with me. All right, here we go. And so we pull up to church, and, um, and we go, me and Sunday and her daughter, and, and we take her into the little children's wing to drop her kid off in Sunday school. And this was like before you ever had to check in or any of that, right? You could just drop your kid off at strangers and, you know, whatever. You just, so we drop the kid off there. And, you know, the looks of the, of the First Baptist mamas as we walk in, it's like, who's the youth pastor? God, I mean, it's like that. And then we go into the sanctuary. When you're the youth pastor, you do announcements. That's all they'll let you do. And so... Um, I get up in front of the church to do announcements, and as I'm standing there, and, and Sonny's sitting like on the second or third row, and I can see the, I mean, the stairs are just tangible, and the little conversations and the whispers and the, all that's going on. And I just remember standing in front of that church just thinking, oh, no. And I went, and I sat next to Sonny and heard a sermon that was probably, I mean, it was I can't even remember what it was. It's probably out of the Bible and about Jesus loves everybody and in an environment where we did not love Sonny. And after the service was over and the whispers continued, there was a called deacons meeting right after the service. And I got called into the deacons meeting. And I walked into this group of men and they said to me, who is that that you brought to church today? And I began to recount. I said, well, you know, I mean, I work at Little Jim, and this is happening, and she kind of invited herself, and I brought her, and, <clears throat> and they said, um, she's not the kind of person that we want here at this church. And we don't think she'd be a good influence on our daughters, and we protect our people from this world, and you're bringing this world into this church. And I wish I could say that I stood up for the sake of the gospel and said, how dare you? But I did not. I was more concerned about what the deacon body thought about me than I was the gospel that day. And so I just kind of bowed my head and tucked my tail and walked out. And then there's Sonny waiting. And everybody had left. And she was waiting on me. And she's a smart girl. She had realized that I'd been called into the principal's office. And she said, they, they had to meet about me, didn't they? And I got in that car, and I lied and lied and lied. No, no, they didn't, and you're just being paranoid. And on the way home, she put the top up, and I look at her, and just trying to make conversation, said, so what did you think about church? And with tears rolling down her face, she said, I've never felt more degraded in my entire life. Now, folks, the night before, she had been naked on a pole for a dollar, and she had to take pills to do it. And then the next day, she is sitting in the very movement that Jesus proclaimed would be the herald of the good news of Jesus Christ. And I would say, rightfully so, she felt more valued at the crazy horse than she did in a local church because of the way she was treated. Because those people. And I was on staff with those people. And when we got back home and, and parted ways, I saw her for about two more weeks before I had to go back to school, and it was awkward, and she wouldn't make eye contact, and she never went back to church. And that has haunted me for the last 20 years. And so I would like to say to you, if you have ever been beaten up or battered or bruised by the church, in the name of Jesus Christ, I want to tell you, I am so sorry that the church is not here to beat you up or to bruise you, but Jesus was battered and bruised for you, and the church is supposed to be the one that tells you that and shows you that. And so when we started the church of 1122, we decided that the church, this church, is a movement for all people. All kind of people, all lifestyles of people, for broken people, for all colors of people, for all people.
to discover and deepen a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that is the church that till my dying day, as long as God puts breath in these lungs, that I want to be a part of, and I know you want to be a part of, church people. And so, may we never, may we never stand in the way of what God is doing, but may we always be proclaimers and examples of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you please stand and pray with me? Our good and gracious Heavenly Father, God, would you call us to repentance when we have ever looked at anybody as those people? God, may we see those people at the foot of the cross. They're just like us. We're all just people, people. God, we're all sinners far from you. God, you died to reach out and reclaim all of us, God, for any that would believe in you. Holy Spirit, would you convict those of us in this room that need to be convicted? Lord, we, we repent of that big brother attitude that's mad when our younger brother comes home and he gets a party. God, may we repent and confess that. And God, Holy Spirit, would you move in this place? Would you supernaturally heal? Because Jesus, you purchase healing by your stripes. Holy Spirit, would you supernaturally heal the broken hearts in this place that were beat up in your name? Jesus, in your name, would you heal hurt and broken hearts? God, if there's any person in this place that has been hurt or beat up or bruised, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, would you call them to healing in this place? And God, may this place always be an emergency room. May it always be a hospital. And God, if it ever shifts into a country club, God, would you shut the doors on this church and scatter your flock to a place where they would be cared for. But God, to the elders and to the staff and to the deacons and to the leadership of this church, God, would you help us be so close to you that we always see people the way you see people as recipients of your grace. God, may we love like you love because you first loved us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, this could be a time of healing if you'll let it. So let us respond by coming to the altar. If you've been beat up and battered and bruised, come to the altar and be healed in Jesus' name. If you need to repent of having that church people kind of attitude, then you come and you lay it at the altar and you leave it here to be consumed by the fire of God, never to take hold of your life again. Let us respond.